G'day folks, it's Rob here, and in today's video, we're going to be looking at nine components that I think will help you create and run a successful aquaponic system. The best place to start, I think, is the fish tank itself. And for any of you folks who have been uh, wandering around the interwebs, you would have come across the caged square totes, or IBCs, that a lot of people use as their fish tanks. They're made from a high density polyethylene, which is HDPE plastic, which is a food grade plastic. Their square shape also makes them easy to fit in uh, small little courtyard areas. And the cage that surrounds the bladder itself makes a great anchor point for attaching cladding to it to make it look a little bit more schmicko. And because these IBCs have a flat wall, you can get a little bit creative like Ben has and create a little bit of a viewing window out of perspex, just so your fish can keep an eye on what you're up to out there in the patch. You can also buy stock tanks and purpose-built aquaculture tanks made from HDPE or fiberglass if your budget stretches that far. Aquaculture tanks generally come in a one is to two or greater height to diameter ratio, which allows for better water circulation. Some of the smaller one to 3000 liters or 270 to 790 gallon-ish tanks can also be supplied with a base. So these bases have little cutouts which allow you to attach a drain fitting to the center of the base of the tank. Now, because there is a drain in the base, we can actually plumb these guys up a little bit differently. Uh, what happens is the swirling motion of the water drags the solids into the centre and we can have our solids lifting outlet situated there to take advantage of that. Uh, what we have is a well on the outside with a couple of holes in the bottom to allow water and the solids through and then in the centre we have a standpipe. Now the solids will enter through the ports in the bottom, uh, be drawn up with the water flow, exit down through the standpipe and then out to a radial flow filter. These round tanks can also have windows fitted. They're a little bit fiddly because of their round shape, of course. And Rob from Bigelow Brook Farm here on YouTube has some fantastic examples over on his channel. So well worth popping over to have a bit of a gander. Some tanks are another large water holding tank that are common to a lot of backyard aquaponic system designs. They're basically a tank that sits at the lowest point of your aquaponic system and houses the pump that moves the water around to different components. Having it at the lowest point allows water from the grow beds and filters and whatnot to flow back into it via gravity, reducing power costs. Having a large sump means you can always expand the amount of grow beds you have on your system. And not only that, it can prolong the time between water top ups as water is consumed by the plants in the system. One of the biggest benefits to having a large sump tank with a pump housed inside there is it means you can have a constant level of water in your fish tank. So they've always got water no matter what happens, even if there's a blackout. And all this is thanks to a pretty nifty little piece of plumbing called a solids lifting outlet or SLO for short. So just to give you a bit of an example, we'll look at a basic slow in an IBC system. So the water enters at the top of the fish tank, displacing some of the water at the base as well as fish solids into the bottom of the slow pipe. It then travels up the pipe and then out through the sidewall in the tank. The skyward facing port on the solids lifting outlet uh, allows air to enter in there so no siphon can be initiated basically draining the fish tank all the way down to the bottom. As I mentioned earlier you can get a good swirl on these round tanks as you can see from those bubbles there. So with our round tank here what I've done is I've put the solids lifting outlet in the centre so that solids lifting outlet drain runs through the tank wall there using a uni seal. Then from there, it runs about halfway down our radial flow cellar, which you'll learn about in a minute, so we can deposit all the solids for collection later. Just before we move on to the next component, I just wanted to mention that I do have that Backyard Aquaponics Beginner's Guide available, 1995 US. Now the guide starts off at what is aquaponics and then moves on through some different components listings, how to cycle your aquaponic system, how to build a basic small aquaponic system with much, much more following that. And it's also transcribed and translated into a number of different languages for you folks where English isn't your first language. Now the guide is online and fully interactive so you can pretty much all ask it a question and it will take you to various different videos. And not only that, you can also ask me for advice personally by clicking on the little advice button down the bottom. That's enough of me spruiking, back to the video. So in your backyard aquaponic system, I really do think it's a good idea to have some sort of solids filtration. Uh, don't worry, you're not taking all the nutrients out of the water like some people would suggest. A lot of those nutrients are found suspended in the water itself. Those solids, if left to uh, accumulate in the grow beds, can actually turn 
and anaerobic and cause all sorts of issues. It's happened to me here. Uh, you can end up with a nitrite spike, which in turn can actually um, put your fish's lives in danger. So I prefer to remove all those solids out of the system. Those solids don't have to go to waste though. They can go out onto your veggie patch or around the base of your fruit trees, or they can be added into an aerated mineralization tanks, which makes the elements more available for the plants and added back into the system at a later date. I'm not going to get into that in this clip here. That'll be one fur down the track. So the two most common solids filters or settlers you'll see used in backyard aquaponic systems are the swirl or the radial flow settler. Now the radial flow settler actually outperforms the swirl filter by quite a margin. So I thought what I'd do is just quickly run through its components and how it works. So at the base of the filter you have a pipe that receives the water from the solids lifting outlet from the fish tank. That's connected inside the filter to a standpipe that runs towards the top of the filter body and inside a stilling well. The stilling well is a larger diameter pipe than the standpipe and is generally about one half to two thirds the height of the filter itself. There's also an exit pipe that takes the clean water out to the next component in the system and in the base you'll find a drain fitting that runs through the wall and is fitted with a valve that can be opened when it's time to clean the solids from the base. It's pretty simple how they work. The water enters the filter via the pipe in the base and is redirected upwards through the standpipe. That standpipe discharges the water at the top of the stilling well that then redirects the flow downwards towards the main chamber of the filter itself. The water in the base isn't moving as fast, so the incoming water velocity decreases, allowing the solids to fall out of the water column and collect on the base of the filter for removal later. Another little DIY filter that comes in handy if you've got your pump in with your fish is called the canister filter. The fish solids enter the pump, they get macerated by the impeller, and they're turned into very fine particulate. Now, these canister filters are basically a vessel with something like a shade cloth in there. Water enters and filters out the solids and clean water comes out the top. They're very efficient and I've already got a clip posted to the channel on a DIY build if you want to check that out. Now, another filter that is a must for every single aquaponic system is the biofilter. Uh, the biofilter is basically a place for the naturally occurring bacteria to colonize and it's these bacteria that process the ammonia and ammonium, which is a waste product from the fish into fish friendly and plant available nitrates. And the most common biofilters you're going to see in a backyard aquaponic system are these things here, the media based grow beds. The media in there provides that place for the bacteria to colonize so they can process the waste and keep the system ticking over. These guys can be filled with a variety of different materials. You can use uh, suitable rock, expanded shale, uh, the um, clay media that we use here, and even sand in some specialized systems. Grow beds that use the larger medium can be plumbed up a few different ways. They can be treated as an ebb and flow or flood and drain style bed or as a constant flow. Now the constant flow generally have a lot of oxygenated water flowing through there and then the water just is kept at a constant height the whole time. Now I prefer to use a flood and drain grow bed because that way I know the plants, roots and the bacteria are receiving a good amount of oxygen a couple of times an hour. And to drive the uh, flooding and draining event, I like to use a bell siphon and you'll find a clip in that playlist that not only shows you uh, how they work, a bit of an explanation, but also runs through a very reliable build that I've been using in my system for years. You can also get standalone biofilters and we have one in our system. We have a moving bed bioreactor. We use a purpose-made biomedia uh, for the bacteria to colonize and also add in a lot of oxygen so they can oxidize that ammonia and ammonium all the way through to plant available nitrates. Uh, and from there the water can either flow out to a sump tank, it's nice and clean now, it can be circulated through the system, or it can go directly into a deep water culture or NFT hydroponic style of grow bed. Deep water culture grow bed can be made out of a large trough it basically has a raft either floating on its surface or suspended just above the surface. There are a load of holes in that raft and through those holes you put little neck cups and that allows the roots of the plants to dangle down into the nutrient rich water that is slowly passing through the bed. 
Uh, another method of growing your plants is called nutrient film technique. This method is very popular with um, hydroponic green growers, lettuce growers and herb growers and that sort of thing. Uh, the plants are basically sitting in net pots and there's a thin film of water that travels over the top of the roots supplying nutrients. If the only plant growing systems you're using are the NFT or the deep water culture you will need some form of biofiltration and when, that's when those um, moving bed bioreactors come into their own. Just um, tacked on after the solids filter and out of the way, processing all the waste for the fish, making a plan available. Now to move all this water around from the tanks to grow beds and filters and whatnot, we're going to need a pump. And the best little pumps for a backyard aquaponic system, I think, are the little magnetic drive pond and aquarium pumps. They're readily available around the world, relatively cheap, and they're designed to handle a small amount of solids, um, such as fish poop and other bits and pieces that you'll find in a backyard aquaponic system. Now, when it comes to sizing the pump for your system, it really does pay to have some idea of the layout of your system in mind, mainly because uh, all the walls of the pipe, the water will be flowing through from the pump, and all the little bends and elbows and whatnot, they are going to slow down the velocity of that water. Not only that, but how high you're pumping it will grow greatly affect uh, the flow rate of the water as well. And there's also another rule of thumb to keep in mind, and that is that the total volume of water in your fish tank needs to be changed over at least one and a half times an hour minimum. I prefer twice an hour, but one and a half should see you by. So once you factor in the turnover rate in the fish tank and also the flow loss due to friction and head height, it does pay you to um, oversize your pump a fair bit just to make sure that there is a complete and um, proper turnover of water in your system. So fish also require dissolved oxygen in the water, so air pumps are another crucial component, I think, for a reliable backyard aquaponic system. Now when it comes to sizing the air pump, there is a basic rule of thumb, and that is you want it to pump a minimum the entire volume of your fish tank every hour, so you know that the fish have plenty of dissolved oxygen, even on the warmest days, when the water doesn't tend to hold a lot. Another essential bit of kit is a backup air system. Now, they're going to come into play if there's ever a blackout, they'll be able to deliver oxygen to your fish to at least keep them alive until the power comes back on. Now, there's a couple of um, pumps that have lithium ion batteries in there. As Soon as the power turns out, they kick on and they can supply your fish with air for um, anywhere up to about 12 to 18 hours from the different models that I've seen. I've built a standalone 12 volt backup air supply. It's got a car battery that supplies the power, a relay that initiates a pump when the power goes off. And you can find a complete build clip for that down in the playlist linked below. Now a crucial bit of kit that a lot of people neglect when they first start out is a test kit. I think it's a must have. Now there's a commonly used test kit called the API freshwater test kit. It measures your pH, a low and a high range, ammonia, nitrite and nitrate. It comes into its own when you're cycling a system, uh, when you're trying to add ammonia sources in there and you want to wait until you see some nitrite appear and then the nitrate and then the nitrite and the ammonia drop and you know your system cycle. Very quick explanation. And the pH definitely comes in handy when it comes to buffering your system. After a while, when your system matures, uh, you'll end up losing a lot of alkalinity. Basically, the nitrification process chews up the alkalinity in the water, which causes your pH to drop. And if you've got some sort of pH testing mechanism, you can notice it's dropping, add something in to buffer to bring the pH up into a range that's acceptable for both your plants and your fish. That range is commonly um, 6.5 to 7 on the pH scale. I do hope this has helped you folks out who are new to aquaponics and looking for a couple of pointers when it comes to creating your own system. Don't forget before we go I do have that backyard aquaponics beginners guide 1995 US link down in the description and one will pop up here at the end. Huge thanks to you folks who are supporting us via our patron website farm your own yard and also the YouTube membership program. Thank you very much folks but that's enough from me. I do hope you're all well and happy in your own gardens and aquaponics are booming and I will catch you next video. Cheers folks and happy growing.